hello good morning again i'm going to restart again uh, uh, this is a session about uh, acquired flat food which is a very common topic uh, in our uh, in our exams and that's why i'm just going to go through it uh, most of the things which here are found uh, in orthopedics there's nothing much more i can add apart from the approach to the uh, this thing when i take uh, the questions at the end of this session uh, this session there'll be a presentation which i'm going to do first then I'm going to tell you about the approach to the exams, and then there's some few cases in which it can be presented, and that we'll discuss at the end of the presentation. Uh, as with everything, the first time we start, we, we need to uh, uh, know the anatomy of uh, the tip post tendon. Uh, in the acquired flat foot, uh, to just to make it very clear, acquired flat foot, the most common cause the, 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 is the uh, tip post dysfunction and that's why we're going to talk about the tip post uh, uh, anatomy first uh, the tip tibia is posterior tendon arises from the posterior part of the uh, fibula and the tibia and the interosseous membrane uh, and inserts into the wide area in the area of the foot uh, mainly uh, all the navicular but the, also has insertion into the whole of the foot uh, into most of the metatarsal and tarsal bones, except the fifth metatarsal. Uh, and because of this wide area where it's inserted, uh, as you can see from the picture, it lies on the posterior aspect and medial uh, to the tibiotalar joint and also medial to the subtalar joint. And this is why uh, it acts as a dynamic support and always also all is uh, inverter for the hind foot and adducts and supinates the forefoot because of its wide uh, attachment. And uh, it is antagonistic to the uh, peroneus brevis. So all its functions are opposite of that. And uh, this muscle is also uh, very important because it can lock the transverse joints, creating a rigid liver arm, which is uh, effective in giving a uh, toe of pace uh, of the gait. Um, Another important thing in the uh, anatomy is um, it is supplied by the posterior branches of the uh, posterior tibial uh, uh, artery. And uh, there's a small area, um, about two centimeters from the origin up to six centimeters, uh, which is not a watershed area, which is supposed to have poor intrinsic blood supply. And most of the issues usually uh, start in this area. Uh, this is commonly known. So, this is important because when you're examining, you need to know where to look for this tendon and uh, what you're looking for. It. Uh, usually the presentation is quite straightforward. You can see a, a flat foot like this, bilateral, symmetrical, uh, and it's usually, uh, these heavy insufficiencies occur in more in women, and most of them have other metabolic uh, disorders. If there's a history of uh, steroid use should be looked into and most most of them are seronegative some of them have uh, seronegative inflammatory disorders uh, etiology not very clear um, some say it's post traumatic uh, tendonitis some say it's because of uh, inflammatory reactions around it in which uh, uh, there is some damage to the tendon and uh, because it occurs in the older people there is a say probably an element of uh, micro degeneration, micro tears and degeneration uh, acting together. So overall, it's more like a degenerative picture, but for a period of time of micro trauma. So it's quite not very clear, but what we know is uh, over a period of time, because it's inflammation, pain, discomfort, this progresses if you don't uh, look into it and start treating them as soon as you uh, diagnose them. Uh, in the early pathology, usually there's tenosynovitis, severe pain, discomfort, uh, which leads to the lengthening of this tendon, and therefore making it uh, uh, insufficient. In a sense, uh, the tendon continuity is maintained, um, but it's no longer functional. So, it, initially, the first thing which goes is obviously the pain, and once this uh, insufficiency sets in, then uh, the dynamic arch is lost. 
and if there's no if it's not treated it continues to cause attrition of the static stabilizers of the hind foot and eventually the collapse of the whole foot in the later stages uh, leading to a fixed deformity of uh, which is a typical deformity which you can see uh, you just saw the picture previously uh, it's a pressed planus hind foot valgus forefoot varus with abducted and varus and in varus uh, the differential diagnosis uh, it could be post traumatic so you could have a straightforward uh, injury but most of them although can present as post traumatic there's some inflammatory um, or micro tears which are degenerative procedure in in turn and if you see a similar fat foot in what a young patient you should be mostly thinking about uh, the tarsal coalition not more than not uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, posterior tibialis insufficient. The symptoms, uh, it depends on the stage again. Uh, in the initial stages, it's usually uh, pain on the medial aspect of ankle synovitis, uh, which can lead to weakness. And then, of course, as it progresses more uh, because of the continued attrition, it leads to progressive loss of arch. And in uh, very advanced stages, what can happen is um, he can go to virus to such an extent uh, because of the, the deficiency of the deltoid can actually cause fibular uh, impingement. Uh, so you can get pain on the lateral aspect in the later stages as well. So when we are actually looking at the symptoms and talking about them, we should be continuously be thinking about, depending on where the pain is, what kind of a progress in it has been happening. Or if he has probably a lateral side pain, it's probably quite advanced. So whenever we are taking any history from the patient as well, we need to be looking at all these things in, in this thing because all these symptoms are in sequence and we should be able to pick that up right from, from the history. Uh, usually, uh, the main thing what you look at is uh, ask them to do a single limb heel raise. Uh, if they're able to perform, it's probably stage one, uh, which the stages are going to in the future. Next. And if they're unable to perform, then it's uh, stage two, three, and four. Uh, of course, uh, you need to test for the tibialis posterior tendon, uh, posterior, tibialis posterior um, tendon, and the power will be reduced. Uh, initially, it will be flexible, and later, uh, as time progresses, it's going to be rigid. Uh, this is how typically it looks and uh, and when you look at it the main thing what you're looking at is of course uh, uh, best planus uh, hind foot valgus and the forefoot uh, forefoot abducted and varus okay so this is a, a classification which uh, you have to keep in mind i mean these are available in various uh, forms in different uh, when you go in different books um, but this is the simplest one which i found which i found it very useful there are only three slides which are useful this one uh, the previous picture and the next the treatment slide as long as you're thorough with this the rest of the things once you start practicing it should be easier uh, when there's a degeneration or tear, there's no deformity, it's stage one. Uh, stage two is when the it's uh, the degeneration has got a flexible deformity. Initially, heel valgus uh, with moderate arching, and then uh, the whole of the arch is uh, collapsed. Uh, collapsed. Uh, stage three is uh, fixed deformity, not uh, passively correctable. And stage four is uh, whether there's a valgus tilt of the talus in the angle monsters, uh, mainly um, because of the deltoid insufficiency. So the first thing is when you are actually taking the history and when you're talking to them, you most of the time, as soon as you see a patient, a 60 year old, usually uh, both the times I've seen it's been a female patient, but it doesn't matter. Um, you look at them and when you take a history, you're 
automatically to looking at it and thinking is it in stage one stage two stage three or stage four uh, and uh, if the in one of my cases which i got and the first patient uh, which i got was the patient was in extreme pain and i couldn't actually examine examiner at all the only thing i could find is a tenderness on the on the uh, on the medial aspect and uh, straight away um, uh, the patient was uncomfortable and the examiner asked me to stop and then we started discussing the flat foot theoretically rather than actually examine the patient so in those cases uh, uh, the best thing would be of course to immobilize the patient in a walking cast or boot for three or four months to get the pain under control uh, the main thing is uh, also to make sure you give a heart support uh, if it's not collapsed and uh, you also use a medial and also use a medial uh, hind foot support uh, medial support as well to adjust the balance to it uh, ankle foot orthosis this is an option which you always have to uh, keep in mind uh, sometimes uh, you may get patients who are in very low demand or a very high risk for surgery in which case you need you can put this forward as um, one of the options uh so the next part of it is uh, of course the operative procedure which you will talk about uh once you have investigated and found out what it is so i'll go into that next so if there's no deformity uh but there's an insufficiency in the sense uh, you can't see the flight flat foot which is flexible uh but uh, uh the tibialis posterior is no longer as functional as it should be and then this is the time to think about how we want to deal with this initially we are going to have the conservative measures and of course uh, if a pay, you see there's no improvement or you think there's a progression the best thing is to think about uh, a tendon transfer and uh, possible calcaneal or osteotomy depending on if it's uh, fully correctable or partially correct if there's a mild to moderate uh, flexible deformity as in 2a then you definitely need a medial slide calcaneal osteotomy and if it's a severe flexible deformity then uh, it's going to be a tendon transfer with medial slide calcaneal osteotomy and possible lateral column column lengthening uh after that it's uh, probably going to be a, a double or triple arthrodesis depending on uh, what you find clinically and also uh you know, you may need to get further investigation like ct scan to see if there's any degeneration or then find out the joints which are involved and possibly will need a, a triple arthrodesis or internal fusion and uh, stage 4 yeah, is is a very difficult to treat because uh, in the long term uh, all of them are not uh, very good options so our aim would be is to try to catch them as early as possible the main thing is to recognize it and uh, tailor the treatment according to what the patient needs so the examination approach uh, identifying this is uh, quite easy you you know straight away that it's a, a tip post because most of them do have significant deformities uh, you could either get a picture or you get a picture of one of those investigations they just put it in front of you and say this is what you need to do uh history you need to take a relevant history unless you know the classification which i told you there you are basically trying to uh, from the history trying to put this patient into one of those categories and then decide the plan for your treatment even before examining the patient and of course examination nothing goes forward with the examination uh, as important as the history uh so in that uh, again a systemic approach uh which uh, we we'll go through now and then uh, what a few cases which we can discuss i think with approach for the frc is most more than theory bit of it which can we can go on each of that we can keep on talking a lot i think we need to take the cases discuss and then it will, the interaction will be much better so so the his, history obviously the age is a typical uh slightly old age people uh and 
they will give you a typical history. Usually there will be, uh, most of them they will see a history of trauma, but it's probably a bit of tendonitis with Scott was bad indeed. And then the, and they will, most of the time, will be able to tell you the progression. Uh, past medical history is very important. Uh, this is uh, apart from uh, deciding whether we are going to intervene or not. We also need to know if there are other reasons why it could be uh, causing uh, problems like probably the strength injuries where you can get a complete flat foot. Uh, flat foot is the inflammatory arthropathy. Is the patient fit enough to undergo in a, any intervention at all? And of course, we need to know anything has been done in the past as well. So we can start start the next part of it. And of course, we need to look into the expectations of these patients. Uh, if it is a long case, which is, we need to be going through all these things. Most of them are short cases. Uh, you might be asked to say, ask one or two questions and then carry on. So basically, uh, you try to cut short as much as possible and uh, plan accordingly. Uh, the inspection, uh, this, is, this, this has to be done very, very quickly. As soon as you see from front, and you see it's a, uh, it's a flat feet. Uh, ask them to turn around and ask them to walk. Uh, gait is important. And uh, then you observe from behind and ask them to do a heel raise to find uh, with a, uh, the uh, valgus well, correctable or not. And then look into the deformities, whether it's fixed or uh, flexible. You can test for the PTT tendon and areas of tenderness. Uh, you can actually ask for them before trying for, to test the areas of tenderness because it can be very, very uncomfortable. Of course, uh, we can look into the investigations. Uh, the radiographs, yes, I'll just go into it. These are the radiographs. So even if you take usually a standard, AP and lateral uh, weight bearing radiographs. And here you can see the tails um, uh, and the first metatarsal are in different lines. And also when you look at this one, you can see the talus uh, uh, is not in the same line as the first metatarsal, which is an indication uh, that this, uh, fluff, uh, this uh, tip post uh, insufficiency. And also the calcinate pitch is low. So, the, uh, this is a picture where there's a uh, uh, deltoid insufficiency leading to calc uh, fibular impingement. And in the initial stages, the MRI does help. But uh, you can be given any of these to start off with. So, point to make. When you yeah, go for yes, exams, please. an acquired flat foot is, there could be a variety of causes of acquired flat foot, but tip yeah, post yeah. is one of the causes. So don't yeah, think yeah. it's always going to be tip post insufficiency. You're going to have other causes. Of flat yes, foot, yes, I think yes. that I went for exams. Yeah. There are four different causes of flat foot which came for the exams and don't get yeah. caught out. It's always going to be tip post. That's one thing yeah, which yeah. I probably want to highlight with other guys. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. very good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree yeah. entirely. I mean, uh, in the FSS exam, one of the main because things is to keep your, uh, keep, keep your options open. And when you're thinking or even examining the patient, you are always thinking, could it be that this, this thing? I mean, most of the time, it's the post dysfunction. What I meant to say is Correct. when you're taking through the history, uh, basically, you're trying to rule out other causes. Side, uh, to make a provisional diagnosis, uh, I would take relevant history. Uh, 